गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू दिस दिल्ली लिवर फाउंडेशन सिंपोजियम ऑन सिस्टमिक थेरेपी इन हेपेटोसेलुलर कैंसर व्हेन हाउ एंड फॉर हू आई हैव एन अ वेरी नॉलेजेबल एंड वेरी वाइज मॉडरेटर विद मी डॉक्टर प्रोफेसर संजय सतपथी हु इज अ वेरी वेल नोन हेपेटोलॉजिस्ट फ्रॉम यूएस यू नो एवरीबॉडी इज वेरी वेल नोन इन इंडिया and uh, uh well uh over a period of time the uh, knowledge on liver cancer has expanded and exploded and uh, we have not only identify high risk population for patients with liver cancer we have identified the risk stratification we also know that uh, detection of liver cancer at the early stage is curable however in most part of the world where resources are limited the most of the liver cancer do occur that is africa far east and asia even in the developed developing country like us and you were you know despite resources the incidence of liver cancer is on the rise obviously because of various lifestyle diseases and have patients suffering from hepatitis c who are pre existing as well as alcohol now there is a large group of patients uh, 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 who are presenting in advanced stage and not in a curable stage and most places do not have screening technology or surveillance for high risk patient to detect treatable cancer or curable cancers they present in advanced stage over a period of time the molecular drivers of liver cancer has been identified and intervention against this molecular drivers are at work now to discuss this management of this group of patients which are the major majority of the patient globally we have brilliant speakers elegant speakers who will be discussing on various aspect or treatment of this advanced cancer because there are many therapies or drugs now available and has been cleared by the fda as well as world over to treat this advanced cancer albeit not to clear cure them but to improve the qualitative as well as quantitative life i'll request my friend and moderator dr sanjay satpathi to invite the speakers and introduce them sanjay we take over and invite the speakers and kindly give them a brief introduction hello everyone um first of all i would like to welcome for this very interactive uh, session that will be uh, going ha happening in the next few moments we uh, the topic of discussion today is systemic therapy uh, in hcc when how and uh, and for whom we have eminent speakers as you, uh, dr achary already alluded to and to begin this we i'll be inviting uh, professor anil arora who is currently working at the chairman Uh, a department of gastroenterology and hepatology at sir gangaram hospital in new delhi as you all know he is very well known not only in india but across uh, across the world and even well known in usa as well i would like to invite him first to give the talk on molecular mechanism of hcc in relation to systemic therapy before going forward i would like to also introduce the other eminent speakers and uh, for briefly and then i'll go forward from there uh, our second uh, talk would be uh, indications uh, indications and choice of drugs in advanced scc this will be given by dr singhal who is an associate professor of medicine at the university of south dakota sanford school of medicine and transplant hepatologist at the avera transplant institute in addition he is also uh, he also directs the hepatology elective course Uh, for the senior medical students at the star at the Sanford Medical School, and is the chief of clinical research affairs at the Avera Transplant Institute. 
um, his uh, with clinical and translational research interest in alcohol and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, renal injury and cirrhosis, and porphyria doctor singles. Research has been funded by American College of Gastroenterology, NIH, and pharmaceutical industry. He has a, over close to 200 original paper, peer-reviewed articles in national and international journals and book chapters. I would uh, the fo following that we'll have a discussion on role of combination, um, a role of combinations with systemic therapies in HCC. This will be given by Dr. P. N. Rao. Dr. P. N. Rao is a, is in the AIG hospital uh, in um, in Hyderabad. And following this, we'll have the final talk about uh, limitations of current systemic therapy and future perspectives by Dr. Bob Giss. Uh, Dr. Gis, a close friend of mine, is currently an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Nevada Schools of Medicine in Las Vegas. Uh, he serves as the adjunct professor of pharmacy at the SCAG School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in, at UCSD, California, in USA. He completed three uh, year of internal medicine residency at the University of California, San Diego, and a four year of gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles which included transplant medicine. Dr. Giss is a fellow of American Association of Study of Liver Disease. Without making it uh, any further delay, we would start uh, with Professor Anil Arora, who will be talking about molecular mechanism of HCC in relation to systemic therapy. Professor Anil Arora, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, are my slides visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Sanjay for giving me this opportunity. The topic of my presentation is molecular pathogenesis of hepatocellular carcinoma, especially in relevance to the today's topic of systemic therapy in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. HCC is now the fourth most common cancer causing mortality in the world as estimated by WHO. 60 to 70% of these cases tend to occur in the Asia Pacific region because association with the viral type of hepatitis, which is a major reason for development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Despite advances in the outcome of HCC and the research which is associated with it, still the prognosis is dismal. Two-year survival in hepatocellular carcinoma is only 50%, whereas only 10% of the patient will survive more than five years. Most of the patient, by the time they present to us, they are unfortunately in the advanced stage of the disease. If you look at the worldwide distribution of hepatocellular carcinoma, it does parallel to the prevalence and incidence of the various type of viral hepatitis, be it in the Europe, North America, Asia, and Africa region. Even in countries like US, major component and major proportion of, hepat of HCC is still, 50% is still related to a hepatitis viral infection, which are not only treatable, but are today totally curable. Cirrhosis, which is present in almost 70 to 90% of the patient, is the major driver for development of hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, it is the single largest risk factor in development of hepatocellular carcinoma. The various factors include HBV infection, HCV, heavy alcohol consumption, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and hemochromatosis, which I have highlighted. In fact, the very fact that if you have hemochromatosis, you have a 200 times more risk of developing hepatocellular carcinoma than any of other known etiologies. In spite of the fact that we have good antiviral drugs available for hepatitis B and C, still we are not able to substantially reduce the incidence and the prevalence of hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, over the last 20 years in US alone, HCC has increased by almost 140%. And we are glad to have Dr. Sanjay as one of the proponents of HCC research joining us today for this uh, program. Now, how does HCC develop in patient with a normal liver? In a normal liver, you will first have chronic inflammation, be it because of hepatitis or non-hepatitic factors like alcohol or NASH. With passage of time, untreated, unabated inflammation will lead to development of cirrhosis of the liver. At some point of the time, during attempts to regenerate and degenerate, you will develop dysplastic nodules, which will turn into an early HCC. This is the time when we, we catch hold of the disease process and we can nip it in the bud. But unfortunately, 
by the time the patient lands up to us, the patient already has an advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. So a normal liver can be damaged because of these reasons. And at some point of time, during the process of regeneration and degeneration, there are molecular mechanisms in the form of MIC, EGF amplification, IGF overexpression or HERT overexpression, which lead to development of dysplastic nodules. And once you have suppression of the tumor suppressor genes, primarily P53, which is an extremely important component of pathogenesis of HCC, you tend to develop hepatocellular carcinoma in the early stage. And by the time you have HCC, there will be a plethora of molecular mechanisms, which will not only lead to progression of the disease, but will also lead to spread of the disease. And that is the time, unfortunately, poor patients come to us for help in management of hepatocellular carcinoma. In fact, if you look the way a normal liver gets injured by these noxious agents, be it B, C, alcohol, NASH, or aflatoxins, so you will have an injury by the normal physiological mechanism. The body will try to overcome it with repeated attempts at regeneration and degeneration. In the bargain, you will have stellate cell activation that leads to abnormal deposition of the fibrosis and the fibrotic material resulting in formation of the cirrhosis. At some point of time, these regenerating nodules do become at autonomous, leading to dysplastic nodules. And uh, during the course of the illness, you will have loss of suppre tumor suppressor genes resulting in formation of hepatocellular carcinoma. All this may be related to telomerase uh, uh, inactivation. There is a substantial role of inflammation which promotes carcinogenesis. Whatever the etiology of noxious injury to the liver, there are two ways by which inflammation can trigger malignancy. The first and foremost is if you have inflammation, that because of the presence of both damage associated molecular patterns as well as a pathological associated molecular pattern, will lead to stimulation of the pro inflammatory cells, which will lead to activation of the NF kappa B pathway, which is important for activation of the mitogenic pathways within the nodule, regenerating nodule, leading to the formation of the tumor cells. At the same time, when inflammation is occurring, you will have a simultaneous injury onto the DNA of the hepatocytes in the form of either DNA damage occurring directly or because of the epigenetic phenomena, because of the viral integration in the case of hepatitis B or oxidative stress because of any injury, especially alcohol, and persistent inflammation in and around the DNA lead to genetic changes which result in formation of the tumor cells. And mind you, these tumor cells on its own lead to formation of large amount of NF kappa B and STAT3 activation, which again lead to both redevelopment of the tumor as well as non-resolving inflammation. So you have inflammatory cells which are secreting, secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines, which activate these pathways primarily in the form of C-June and GNK pathways, which have both cell proliferating action as well as anti-apoptotic action. Second mechanism by which inflammation causes HCC is that in a normal course of the events, if you have a, any cell which is exposed to the incoming pathogens, either in the form of damps or PAMPs, so this normal monocyte will respond by release of these substances called interleukin-12 and interferon gamma. This will lead to stimulation of the M1 type of macrophages, which are pro which produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. So they will be causing activation of the immune system, as well as they will tend to be tumoricidal and microbicidal. But what happens once you have tumor occurring in patient with cirrhosis of the liver? It has twin problem. First of all, tumor itself is releasing these cytokines called IL-4 IL and IL-13 and IL-10. And at the same time, they are recruiting tumor cells and other monocytes into the tumor environment. Now, once you have a tumor cell which is recruiting the monocytes, these monocytes are more preferentially likely to be directed towards the M2 type of macrophages. M2 type of macrophages are more likely to have T helper 2 activation resulting in angiogenesis, phagocytic activity as tumor modeling and regeneration. So what is happening is that you have a system in the body or a liver which is getting tolerant to the immune system. How does it occur is that once you have macrophages, they are producing more of TH2 response, which will try to stimulate the T-reg response. 
Once you have a Treg response, there will be suppression of the dendritic cells and suppression of the immune system as well as upregulation of the Th17 cells. So once you have suppression of the immune recognition cells, that is dendritic cells which fail to recognize the antigen, you will have overstimulation of the Th17, which will be important for angiogenesis and further pro poor prognosis of the HCC. So two factors are simultaneously occurring. You have non-viral drivers, that is non-inflammatory damps, or you have viral drivers through the process of inflammation. So by the process of inflammation, you are stimulating the intracytoplasmic toll-like receptors, which lead to induction of the TNF alpha and IL-6. These are potent pro-inflammatory cytokines. They are known to stimulate this STAT-3 type of uh, in, uh, in supranuclear factors, which lead to angiogenesis, which lead to oncogenic transformation of the dysplastic nodules. Similarly, the non-viral non factor through the help of inflammosomes, they are trying to suppress the apoptosis. So two things are occurring. So you are decreasing the apoptosis, thereby decreasing the uh, killing of the abnormal cells. At the same time, you are letting the normal cells proliferate, resulting in formation of the hepatocellular carcinoma. So there may be di different mechanisms in the different type of etiologies in hepatitis B, depending on what stage does the patient come to you, be it in the chronic early chronic hepatitis phase, chronic liver disease, or in an early HCC, various different pathogenetic mechanisms come, may come into play. You may have inflammation, you may have redox potential or oxygen free radicals, which may be causing the injury. There may be telomerase reactivation, or there may be HBX, which is causing stimulation of the pro proto-oncogenes, or there may be integration of the virus, which is causing suppression of the P53 or tumor suppressor genes. In hepatitis C, primary problem is that you have a virus which is giving you a lot of antigens which are acting at different levels for transmission of tra transformation of the dysplastic nodule into a pre-neoplastic or early HCC. This could be in the form of ROS, persistent chronic inflammation, stimulating angiogenesis. These are the various antigens of hepatitis C which are playing different roles at different points of time in the natural history of the disease. Similarly, in alcohol, you have combination of the reactive oxygen species and activation of the activated protein and TLR signaling, which are important for causation of hepatocellular carcinoma by the various mechanisms that I have shown. Surprisingly, in NASH, you have plethora of problems which can cause HCC. In fact, of all the disease processes, this is the one lesion which causes the maximum incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. The mere presence of hyperinsulinemia acts through not only the pro-inflammatory cytokine components, but also through the endocrine mechanisms by increasing IGF, as well as by increasing androgen, you are able to stimulate a lot of pro proto-oncogenes which lead to hepatic carcinogenesis. So irrespective of what the stimulus is, you, this is the tumor cells which need stimulation of the nuclear receptors at the surface. Then you have intermediate number of receptors which will take the signal from the surface down to the nucleus. And in the nucleus, you need to have activation of the beta, can, beta catenin, C mic, and C June, which ultimately lead to proliferation and survival of the cells even in the adverse conditions. Whereas at the same time, you are trying to suppress the tumor suppression gene of which P53 is a classical example. So if we are trying to develop drugs against proliferation of the tumor cells, you need to block the endothelial cells with the receptors. You need to take care of the PD-1 antibodies, which are trying to bind the PD-L1 ligands onto the tumor cells, or else you block all the receptors which are present on the surface of the hepatocytes, which are abnormal in the form of HCC. So these are the various drugs which have limited and different efficacy and action against the receptors which I have shown you. If you see, lanmartinib is one drug which has large number of actions against uh, so many receptors present onto the surface. So the key genetic events in HCC include, you need to have suppression of the tumor suppressor gene. This is very important in patients with, with in, on alpha aflatoxin exposure, especially aflatoxin-B1. You have beta catenin activation, which is extremely important in HCV-related liver disease. And you have uh, 
EGF receptor stimulation, which gives you relevance in terms of aggressiveness of the tumor. The more the expression of the EGFR, the more will be the metastasis and the tumor. So this is what happens in patients who have uh, uh, in patients who have hepatocellular carcinoma, you have large number of the receptors which are present onto the surface. And these, because they are autonomous, they do not need the help of the body. They have autocrine stimulation. So they are important for survival, differentiation, proliferation, and invasion of the tissues. Similarly, on endothelial cells, you have large number of the receptors which are important for proliferation of the surrounding vessels, stroma, mesenchymal tissue, so that the tum tumor is making merry at the expense of the body. So you need to have drugs, and one of the drugs like lanmartinib may have multitude of the action. It will have action against host of the receptors onto the surface of the hepatocytes of the tumor cells, as well as on the endothelial cells. So you may have multitude of the action. Whether it is useful or not, I'm sure the further speakers will be talking in detail about it. Any role of immunotherapy strategies in hepatocellular carcinoma. Before understanding that, I think it is extremely important to know the basic science of tumor detection. So this is a normal antigen presenting cell. Once it has to recognize a foreign cell as an abnormal cell, it has to use a TCR signaling mechanism with the help of co-stimulatory interaction. Once it is stimulated, you will have activation of this cell, which is going to get rid of this abnormal cells. But unfortunately, what happens in hepatocellular carcinoma is that in normal course of the events, this is the dendritic cell, which ideally should recognize the new antigen, which is coming from the tumor. So this is the tumor antigen, which should be recognized by the dendritic cell. And this dendritic cell should present this tumor antigen along with MHC1 onto the surface. And then this should get attached to the T cell receptor, which is present on the T cell. So what should happen is this should get activated and T cell should get rid of the tumor cells by recognizing this antigen. When T cell is trying to recognize this abnormal antigen, it does require the services of this co-stimulatory molecule. Unfortunately, if you have ligands attached to the tumor cell in the form of ligands against CTL4 or PD-1, these T cells do not get activated and they are not able to cause apoptosis or killing of the cells. So if you give a drug like CTLA4 inhibitor like ipilimumab, you are able to get rid of the abnormal cells in the form of HCC cells. So with stimulation of these cells, the normal cells can be turned into a cytotoxic cells. So this T cell receptor will recognize the antigen presented on the tumor cell along with MHC and will be counted as an abnormal cell. Now, the only blocking points in between the cytotoxic T cell and tumor cells will be PD-1 and the PD-1 ligands. So if you're able to counteract PD-1 by the antibodies called nivolumab or prembrolizumab or by counteracting PD-L1 ligand by duralumab, you may be able to induce a lot of perforins and granozymes, which are going to lyse the tumor cell and get rid of the tumor cells. So what happens in normal course of circumstances in any cancer is that the tumor cells, they tend to develop newer antigens called tumor associated antigens. And during the course of the illness, newer and newer antigens keep developing. The older tumor cells, which are differentiated, they keep, keep getting out, whereas the newer cells keep proliferating and hence the tumor gets perpetuated. So if you can have an adoptive cell therapy, that means if you stimulate the autologous lymphocyte with cytokines or tumor antigens, using either the cytotoxin-induced killer cells or infiltrating lymph lymphocytes, you may be able to generate modified T cells, which may be able to recognize these abnormal cells. One of the new concepts of treating based on immunopathogenetic understanding of HCC is something called chimeric antigen receptor cell therapy. What it means is you take out a T cell from a person who is infected with HCC, bring it out, insert a gene which codes for a specific new antigen, be it GPC3 or CMAT or PDL1. And once that has been inserted into the T cell, you grow millions of these cells out in a in, in vitro fashion. And once you infuse this, this is called CART T cell therapy for immunotherapy of HCC, then it is presumed that part of the cells which are able to pick up these antibodies against the antigen present onto the surface of the HCC may be lysed. Similarly, on the same basis, 
we may be able to develop a vaccine against hepatitis C if you're able to identify the antigens which are important onto the surface of the hepatocytes, which are turned into malignancy, uh, which are responsible for generating the immune system. So to sum up, in patients with cirrhosis of the liver, you have a plethora of noxious agents, which are trying to not only cause cirrhosis of the liver and repeated attempts for degeneration and regeneration. At the same time, you have a persistence of inflammation, leading not only to the direct injury through the activation of NF-KPB pathways, but also causing microenvironmental changes directly and indirectly affecting the genetic and epigenetic changes in the DNA, resulting in the formation of hepatocellular carcinoma. So if we can understand the molecular pathogenesis of HCC, I think the manipulation of the host immunity by HCC allows us to flourish undetected and have multicentric presentation because of the inflammation and underlying cirrhosis. Both of these in, term, in terms of persistence are extremely important in causation of HCC. Traditional surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy is followed by high recurrence rate. And hence, a good knowledge of the proliferative pathways and immunotherapy has shown efficacy in delaying the progression of the advanced tumors and protecting post-op patient against the recurrence of the cancer. So a good knowledge for further development of multiple TKIs and evolumab and other immunosuppressive agent is extremely useful. With that, I'll stop sharing my slides and hand it over back to the moderators. Well, Sanjay, I think uh, take over. You invite. Uh, this is uh, this is truly an elegant talk, and I I think this is a way Doctor Arora always talks about the pathophysiology and pathogenesis in such a simple term and such a complex topic. Um, I mean, truly amazing. And I uh, heads up to you. And uh, we can probably have the, some questions at the end of this. Um, uh, all the uh, 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 topics are deliberated then. We'll go over and having some questions and we'll go for the discussion at that point. I will uh, next uh, invite Professor um, Aswini Singhal uh, to talk about systemic therapy for HCC indications, choice of drugs at this time. Prof uh, Professor uh, Singhal, please. Well, thank you, Sanjay, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Acharya and organizers for uh, this opportunity, especially Anil. Um, and I would agree completely with the uh, Sanjay on uh, his uh, compliment to Anil on taking uh, a difficult topic always and making it so simple uh, and making the second uh, presentation easier for me. Uh, and at the outset, I would like to acknowledge that uh, uh, I'll be giving uh, kind of a, uh, a flavor of what are the drugs available as of today for treating uh, advanced SCC uh, in a systemic fashion and uh, how we can choose these drugs uh, in treating uh, our patients uh, in a much better way than we probably did a couple of years ago. Uh, here are my disclosures and none of them is related to uh, the presentation today. So for the next uh, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, we'll learn what are the effective uh, systemic treatment options available for advanced SEC and how we can identify patients uh, suiting to a particular uh, regimen, and then recognize that uh, treating hepatocellular carcinoma, especially today, uh, is a multidisciplinary approach uh, if we talk about advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so here is the landscape of systemic therapy in HCC. So uh, 10 years, uh, over 10 years, uh, sorafenib, as you can see, uh, kind of a monopoly in treating uh, systemic uh, treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma uh, until uh, we got uh, this uh, frontline therapy uh, this year got approved, which is a combination of um, a VEGF inhibitor and an immunotherapy. Uh, for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. And in the course of time, uh, especially around the uh, last two years, there have been many, as Anil pointed out, um, uh, not only multi-kinase inhibitors, but also a lot of immunotherapy options which have been approved by the FDA for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. So we may not be at the best of the times, but um, definitely much better time in treating our advanced patients. 
so taking you back uh, almost 10 years or 11 years, uh, we know that this study published uh, a decade ago uh, on uh, sorafenib uh, compared to placebo in advanced hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. And uh, we all know that there was about three to four months survival difference with a median survival of about 11 months with sorafenib and eight months with placebo. And the drug got approved. And since then, we've been using um, this for treating our advanced patients for chemotherapy. And uh, uh, about uh, two years ago, uh, this study Reflect was published uh, comparing lenvetinib, another uh, multikinase inhibitor, and, and it showed you the multitude of actions of lenvetinib. And this was compared to sorafenib uh, in this randomized uh, open label. Uh, and this was designed as a non-inferiority uh, study because um, uh, sorafenib was not eligible for many patients or not tolerated with many patients. So looking for an alternative. And this was close to about 1,000 patients um, of hepatocellular carcinoma in an advanced stage, either BCLCB or C. Uh, and then child PUA. And remember, most of the trials have enrolled uh, child A and BCLC stage B or C. And this particular study excluded uh, those with portal vein invasion. And as you can see, it uh, was non-inferior. So in a way it was negative study, but actually it was designed as non-inferior. So I would say it was a positive study. Uh, and lenvetinib gave about 14 months uh, of uh, median survival time. And then uh, but the difference was that I think this is an important aspect of this particular study, uh, which was uh, kind of a uh, evolution in how we evaluate clinical trials in hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, because we're looking at progression-free survival and also more importantly, the objective response. rate. And this was using the uh, MRESIST criteria on CT scan. And you can see uh, that lenvetinib, although uh, non-inferior to serafinib, but was much superior in terms of how the tumor was responding to treatment on CT scan. And uh, this included partial as well as complete responders uh, to the treatment. And that way, lenvetinib was superior. And that got approval for as an alternative treatment to uh, serafinib in the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma. And since then, ob objective response rate became a kind of an important secondary endpoint. And you would see in this particular trial also, which is, I think, the game changer um, in the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma published in uh, May of this year in New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, it is zolizumab and bevacizumab combination. Uh, bevacizumab, we all know, uh, is a VEGF inhibitor, and uh, zolizumab is uh, uh, an immunotherapy. And this was compared to serafinib, which was a front frontline treatment until then. And this was again a phase three study uh, based on encouraging response to phase two. And you can see that um, the uh, 500 patients were enrolled in this particular study. Overall survival was a primary endpoint, and then the progression-free survival and objective response were secondary endpoints. And the doses are listed over here of each arm and the number of patients in each arm. And mind it uh, that all the patients were again child PUA, uh, echo performance status zero to one, and uh, BCLC stage uh, B or C. And here are some uh, flavor of the baseline characters. So about uh, seventh decade, most of the patients, uh, about 80% males, and half of them were in Asia and half in the rest of the world. And you can see about uh, ECOG uh, either zero or one, majority child PUA, uh, majority A5, and uh, BCLCB or C stage. And they did have uh, patients with uh, AFP more than 400 in about a third of these patients. And about 60% of these patients did have some kind of uh, uh, either a portal vein invasion or a microvascular invasion or an extra hepatic spread. And there about a quarter of these patients had varices, and we'll talk about the importance of varices in this regimen. And then there were uh, all the uh, you know, etiologies were represented, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and other causes of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And here are the response rates uh, for uh, the regimen compared to serafinib. And as you can see, as early as six months, the curves are separating out in favor of the combination therapy. Uh, compared to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, 
uh, Suraf and Ibn for the first time a regimen came superior to Suraf and Ibn. Uh, and you can see the hazard ratio uh, below 0.6, which is highly significant. This is what happened in and based on this, this trial was halted uh, early because of uh, such a good signal uh, to the extent that median survival was not even reached uh, in the treatment arm or the combination arm. Uh, and it was over 17 months uh, in this particular um, uh, study. So what about the safety profile, which everybody uh, will be eligible for this combination? Uh, I think the major issue is uh, about the bleeding because of the, uh, uh, the way Bevcizumab acts. So there is always the risk of causing, uh, inducing upper GI bleed in patients who have advanced varices or large varices. And you can see it was about 7% in spite of that screening everybody uh, with uh, varices within six months of the study enrollment and treating varices before the patients were exposed to the medication, uh, still there was 7% risk of upper GI bleeding compared to 4.5% in the serafinib bound. So that's the catch and uh, uh, screening uh, strategy in clinical practice also, uh, that many patients may not be suitable for uh, this regimen. And then another thing is these immune-related adverse effects and someone who is already having some autoimmune disease may be a relative contraindication for this kind of regimen. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the uh, grade three or grade four uh, serious adverse events as expected were more in the serafinib group in terms of the GI side effects and, uh, and skin foot reaction, but the immune mediated side effects, uh, grade three to grade four were more common uh, in the uh, atezobeb uh, group, uh, whether it is hepatitis or nephritis uh, or some kind of other skin rash. Uh, and other uh, immune-related adverse effects, which these patients uh, can happen uh, during the course of regimen at any time. So uh, once we know that uh, uh, the frontline treatment became uh, this combination treatment, uh, so what about uh, patients who are not eligible for uh, this regimen to be an alternative to those uh, patients? And more importantly, uh, in the course of time, patients who are not tolerating sorafenib or who are not responsive to serafinib. There are three trials here we have listed. Uh, I have listed the resource trial, which compared regorafenib versus placebo in uh, serafinib uh, tolerating patients, but uh, in responsive to them, about 600 patients. Uh, and regorafenib uh, was superior to uh, serafinib uh, in terms of uh, the uh, median survival time of about 11 months versus 18 months. And similarly, the other uh, 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 medication here, which is uh, cabozentinib, uh, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor, again, about 700 patients uh, turned out to be superior to uh, sorafenib. And this was a group of patients who were uh, sorafenib intolerant patients. And this is a remucirumab uh, trial. And I want to uh, mention here about 300 patients. And all of these are phase three studies. And this was again superior to serafinib, uh, again intolerant patients. But if you look at the original trial, it was a, actually a negative study. But when they did a post hoc analysis, uh, they found a group of patients which are alpha fetoprotein over 400, uh, where uh, RAMU was um, superior to placebo, uh, and therefore uh, is indicated for patients who specifically have uh, AFP more than 400. And that's where it was approved. And then what about the other uh, immunotherapies? Uh, as Anil pointed out, uh, some other uh, treatments got approved. This is pembrolizumab, uh, for, which is Keynote 4, 240 trial. About 400 patients. Again, uh, the inclusion group is the same, as you can see. Uh, this particular excluded patients with portal vein invasion. Uh, and again, the primary endpoints remaining uh, overall survival and uh, progression-free survival. And based on their previous uh, experience with uh, the medications uh, and uh, their phase two data on pembrolizumab, uh, they pre-specified a cutoff point of a p-value of 0.0174. Uh, 
to approve the drug for um, or say it is statistically significant. Uh, as you can see here, that pembrolizumab compared to placebo uh, was uh, significantly uh, uh, no, better than uh, placebo uh, with a p-value of 0.0238. However, it did not uh, reach below the cutoff pre-specified uh, of 0.0174. And uh, progression-free survival was also uh, better than uh, placebo. Uh, the grade three to four adverse events uh, were more common as expected in the treatment group, uh, mainly due to uh, the uh, autoimmune effects or the immune-mediated side effects, uh, leading to treatment discontinuation of over two and a half fold uh, in the treatment arm. So you have to be most immunotherapies cognizant of the fact that immune-related adverse effects uh, can happen with these patients during the course of regimen. And then uh, another drug uh, which got uh, some activation and some uh, excitement was uh, another immunotherapy, Mugulumab, compared to Sorafenib. Again, this was uh, patients who were um, uh, either intolerant or unresponsive to Sorafenib. And this was about uh, 500 to 600 patients, as you can see, actually 700 patients here. Uh, again, the, um, the enrollment is on the same criteria. Uh, these patients were not exposed to prior systemic therapy for hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, remember, some of the, most of the trials before have been exposed to prior uh, treatments, even including local regional therapies, including this one. Uh, that they have had uh, some kind of uh, surgical or local regional therapies in the, in the past. Uh, and if you look at the survival outcome, uh, this was uh, except at the tail end of the curve, uh, you see that uh, there was no difference here in terms of uh, whether you look at the overall survival or progression-free survival comparing the active drug to the serafinib arm. However, when they look at the objective response rate, uh, which is based on the uh, CT scan assessment, you can see nebulumab compared to serafinib was definitely twofold higher uh, in uh, you know, chances of getting an objective response. Even the grade three to four uh, treatment related adverse effects was much less common uh, with uh, nebulumab compared to serafinib and the drug got approved uh, as an alternative to uh, treatment to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And I want to uh, uh, point out this particular trial, which is uh, another combination trial here, uh, which is uh, two um, uh, immunotherapies here, which is nivolumab and epilimumab for advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is a phase two study looking at three doses um, uh, scheduled here, uh, which you can uh, uh, refer to here what the three doses were used in this randomized control phase two study. And the important point I want to make here, if you uh, uh, ignore the complexity of the slide, is that objective response rate, uh, like uh, the, uh, the, 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 the trial we saw before uh, from the New England Journal paper uh, from early this year, uh, reaching in 30s, 30% uh, with all the three regimens, as you can see over here. And based on this uh, exciting response of this combination, uh, the combination got approved uh, as an accelerated approval for uh, phase three, uh, which is currently ongoing. Uh, and we will uh, look at the data once this uh, study enrollment and the analysis is complete, uh, what are the outcomes and the results of this particular combination. So as you can see that there is a lot of uh, drugs which are available for treat advanced hepatocellular carcinoma uh, who, with a systemic approach. And, uh, and I mean, uh, there is no uh, doubt in my mind, and I think in everybody's mind, that the TZO BEV uh, combination is the frontline treatment and the standard of care, as well as the gold standard for future in terms of treating uh, advanced cancer uh, with a systemic chemotherapy. However, uh, we saw that a group of patients uh, would not be eligible uh, for. Uh, this combination, uh, especially those who have large varices uh, or a GI bleed or a varicell bleed uh, patients, uh, unless they are uh, adequately controlled with bending. Uh, and then patients who have had uh, some other contraindications, especially those with autoimmune uh, disease history. Uh, and then there are some alternatives to that group of patients uh, with either sorafenib or lenvatinib, which you can call uh, an alternative first-line treatment 
um, uh, to uh, these of that combination. What about the second and third line treatments? I think uh, regorafenib, uh, cabozentinib, and remucirumab are uh, potential uh, second line combinations, but you must recognize that uh, they are approved uh, only as an alternative to serafinib if uh, serafinib is uh, non responsive or a uh, patient is intolerant to serafinib. And these drugs are only for that particular group of patients based on randomized controlled fashion. But I think uh, you can use uh, in most uh, guidelines, they have been uh, you know, recommended as alternative treatments, even following patients with atezobab combination or lenvatinib combination to which randomized fashion, this has not been studied. Even sorafenib and lenvatinib as an alternative options to atezobab uh, has not been studied in a randomized fashion. And this is, I think we have a, uh, talk in the end by Bob, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're probably going to talk about the future. Um, in addition to uh, this, he may talk about uh, many other things uh, in the pipeline. And then there are third line treatments, which are uh, nevolimumab, pebrolizumab, and nevo EP combination. Uh, we saw uh, various uh, trials, which are exciting. And these are some of the uh, third line drugs, which are available, uh, which can follow in the pipeline. So now we have a lot of options which you can go through. Uh, and remember, these have not been studied as third or second line treatments uh, to any of these medications except um, um, uh, sorafenib. So before I close, I want to acknowledge, uh, and as we all know, that treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and this, I think, applies now in this uh, time when we have so much uh, number of medications uh, outside, I think, puts uh, the volume of the hepatologists. I think uh, until now, when serafinib was the only treatment, uh, we have treated uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in advanced uh, patient yeah. using serafinib as an individual <laughs> with radiologist uh, without involving an oncologist. But I think it is a need of the hour that it is more recognized as a multidisciplinary approach. Hepatologist alone cannot manage these patients and should not manage these patients. Involvement of oncologists becomes mandatory along with radiologists. I think these three people should definitely be part of that multidisciplinary approach when treating an advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. So here are uh, some of the key takeaways. Uh, there are multiple options available to treat these patients. Uh, in a multidisciplinary fashion, as we talked about, etobev combination is the current standard of care and a future reference point uh, for future clinical trials. Our treatment rates have improved uh, from as low as 10% to uh, 30%, but at the best, they are still about 30% or 35%. And that's where I think the future comes, how we can improve this and uh, uh, what is the role of personalizing treatment so that we can achieve good response in every patient or excellent response, uh, the role of tumor genetics and mutations of some of the genes which Anil Arora showed in the pathogenesis, how they play a role in terms of personalizing treatment to uh, individual patients and using precision medicine. And we look forward to also the role of combination, not only of systemic chemotherapies, but how we can use these chemotherapies in a combination approach to local regional therapies also, um, I think uh, P and Ra will talk about it uh, apart from uh, other things, which we will wrap up in the end with uh, Bob's talk. So I won't take much of the time and uh, I would like to stop here and uh, uh, hand it over to the moderators and thank again to the uh, organizers for this opportunity. Well, Professor Single, that was an elegant talk and uh, it is amazing that uh, over the last decade, uh, the landscape for management of HCC had changed so much. I mean, we didn't have no drugs to a first line. <laughs> and now, I'm going to, now we're going to move on to talk about the even combination therapies of uh, systemic therapy with local regional and, and other combination therapy system therapy. Over to Professor P. N. Rao, who is the Director of Hepatology at the ACN Institute of Gastroenterology. Very eminent personality, looking forward to his talk uh, looking uh, over this uh, scenario. Professor, Professor Rao, please. Yeah, over to you. Yeah. 
um i think my first uh, thank you very much dr anil and uh, for first my apologies you know because i think i have read this title a little bit wrongly when i was uh, I've been listening to um, the previous speakers and uh, i think i have read it totally wrong in the sense that the role of combination therapies uh, which involves these the drugs which are available i did not realize that it is with the loco regional therapy along with the systemic therapies uh, and uh, therefore but uh, the last moment i will not be able to say but that can be covered in the this one so there will be uh, some amount of uh, major repetitions will be there but uh, having prepared that i have to go through that one my apologies and then this is because perhaps we did not uh, talk to each other i and talk to him no i am and my apologies for that one <clears throat> um anyway the as uh, already been uh, dr singhal and then uh, everybody has elaborated on that one on the role of uh, combination therapies in hcc um, is a sort of a, I, i was thinking that the symposium since the symposium on systemic therapy uh, it is mainly the the drug combinations you know which uh, i was being uh, i thought alluded to since it's been uh, covered so elegantly dr singhal and uh, as we know but uh, one thing which is very important here what is apt today in the in the treatment of hcc may not be the same in future this has been clearly been um, identified recently by the way fda has given an approval for the combination of fm pembrolizumab and lenvatinib in uh, 2019 and then it's withdrawn in september 2020 so uh, tomorrow when you talk about it it may be an entirely different scenario and uh, the why we should have a combination therapy you know we have a cytotoxic chemotherapeutic drugs we have molecular targeted therapies and we have these immune checkpoint inhibitors is been really Share the slides, please. Pardon? Can you share your slides? We're not seeing your slides. Not seeing slides. Yes. I'm shared. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, you're able to see now. Yeah. And if you yes, we're seeing your slides. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, but uh, the the role of a combination therapy is in hepatocellular carcinoma, and uh, since this is a symposium on the systemic therapy, uh, I was mainly concentrating on the role of the combination of these drugs rather than the combination with the loco regional treatments. and we know that with the experience which we had with the other viruses and also with the non alcoholic fatty liver disease that you know only one drug or one one drug is not sufficient and um, and then we should have a combination therapies in many of the diseases and then hcc is no exception for that one and why should you have a combination therapy and this we have the cytotoxic chemotherapeutic drugs we have this molecular targeted therapies which have just been been alluded to and the immune checkpoint inhibitors it has been clearly been seen that the in the randomized trials with the anti pd1 monotherapy either in the first line or in the second line did not demonstrate a statistically significant improvement in the overall survival on the other hand the preliminary results and then early phase results has indicated a superior response when these combinations have been used that means either anti pd1 or anti pd l1 and anti ctlf4 or other antigenic molecular targeted therapies and here the uh, i have given in a nutshell the what what could be the possible combinations among these with the advanced uh, hcc on the left hand side panel you are seeing this program death ligands and then the program death receptors and the drugs which are responsible for that one are here the nivolumab pembrolizumab durvalumab and atezolizumab 
and the CTL4, that is the cytotoxic T lymphocytes associated protein, it's also known as CD152, and the drugs are epilimumab and tremilumumab. On the right hand side, you've got these molecular targeted approaches, which we know that uh, has already been alluded to, all these drugs are very familiar. And the combinations with the PD1 or CL4 are the combinations with the immune based approaches with the molecular targeted approaches uh, are the ones you know, which we have uh, already gone through, which I'm going to um, just reiterate them. And Dr. Anil has already told you about this that is, the, by blocking the CTL. LA4 and the PD1 blockade, we are facilitating the, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors to act upon. And here we have the molecular, the, the VGF inhibition drugs, you know, which at, as I said already at various stages, they are being active here. And, and uh, with the, the, let me go back to the sorafenib era. At this time, we have got a cytotoxic chemotherapies with cytotoxic chemotherapies, and we have a cytotoxic chemotherapies with the sorafenib and sorafenib and then other targeted drugs. And way long ago, people did try the systemic chemotherapies or hormonal therapies in advanced hepatocellular carcinoma including the doxorubicin combination with the PIAF, that is cisplatin, interferon, doxorubicin, edromacin, and pipiloroviracin, and the other combinations, and the hormonal therapies have also been tried, but there has been a dismal response, and there was no proven efficacy. And these are the cytotoxic chemotherapies which have been tried in hepatocellular carcinoma. You can see on the left side, doxorubicin, capacitabin, and and these are monotherapies and these are polytherapies, combination therapies, and none of them have really succeeded. And they did make a lot of a trials of these. And after the sorafenib has come, and then people, after the sorafenib, people have started combining the chemotherapy agents of the sorafenib. And one of them, which is prominently was doxorubicin plus sorafenib and then sorafenib alone. But this was interrupted after a planned interim analysis demonstrated that a higher toxicity in the combination group and because the primary and secondary endpoints were not met. And here you can see that, you know, the doxorubicin and sorafenib combination with the sorafenib and uh, there's been no advantage and these chemotherapy replications in association with these molecular targeted therapies has largely been given up long ago. And sorafenib with the other targeted drugs, and all these are failed phase three trials in the advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, but one of them which is combined with this sorafenib with the erlotinib, and again I can see that is a failed one, and then there's a median OS did not uh, differ from the sorafenib. And these are the, some of the drugs you know, which have failed already and uh, the adding erlotinib to the sorafenib did not help. Unlike the conventional cancer therapies, the immunotherapeutic uh, approaches do not really directly target the tumor cells. They target the patient's immune system as already been discussed with Dr. Professor Anil, the tumor microenvironment, and out of this we know that the immune checkpoint blockade and these ICBs have been the focus of the cancer chemotherapy, not only in hepatocellular carcinoma, in most of the other cancers as well. And what is the scientific rationale behind this immune tolerant checkpoint inhibitors and the anti-VGF? There are four roles have been proposed. That is the recognize, recruitment, reprogram, and restore. The recognize the anti-VGF by inhibiting the VGF mediated suppression of the dendritic cells, which has dendritic cells, as uh, Anil has emphasized, uh, very important in the immune components, and enables the efficient priming and then activation of the T cell responses against the tumor antigens and recruitment of the more by the infiltration by the T cells into the tumor and pro reprogramming. There is a, a reprogramming of the tumor microenvironment from uh, immune suppressive to immune permissive 
and restore and then the immunomodulatory effects of the anti-VGF mediated the immunomodulatory effect are going to be added to the immune checkpoint therapies. And the preliminary results from the early phase clinical trials indicated the superior response rates and duration of the responses when anti-PD-1 and then anti-PD-1 uh, ligand agents were combined with the anti-CTLA-4 or anti-antigenic molecular targeted therapies. And there are empty number of uh, drugs, as you can see here, that the, these are the early phase trials of the immunotherapy combinations in HCC. And uh, some of these trials have been, uh, most of the trials, uh, some of these have completed, which have already been alluded to Dr. Singhal, uh, that is atizolumab and bevacizumab versus serafinib. I mean, I will not go into the details of that one because it's elegantly uh, discussed the, the intricate aspects of this particular drug combination. And this has already been told. And then what we can see here that the ones which have been uh, the atizolumab and bevacizumab, and for the second line therapy, nivolumab and then ipilimumab are the ones which has been recognized by the FDA recently. And uh, you can see here that the single agent nivolumab has, uh, uh, although it was recognized earlier, but uh, the responses have been much greater with the combination therapy here. And this combination of which has already been discussed here, the bevacizumab is an anti-antigenic agent with additional immunomodulatory effects. And then in combination, this will further enhance the ATIS efficacy by reversing the VEGF-mediated immune suppression to promote T-cell infiltration into the tumor. And this is the first um, phase one study and then with the combination of ATI and bevacizumab, and later they were added because they would like to compare the combination with ATI alone. And it's been clearly been shown here that ATI alone is not sufficient, as you can see here, that the median PFS is 3.4 versus the combination, and then which is about 5.6. And these are the drugs which we have already been alluded to. And the, this combination has been approved in the, in the month of May here. And this is the one which has been alluded by Dr. Singhal, that's a New England General Medicine. And this has been considered as a groundbreaking because the earlier nivolumab and pembrolimab, both programmed cell uh, PD-1 antibodies have so failed to show the efficacy as a first and second line therapeutics respectively in the phase three clinical trials. And this is the first time since sorafenib that uh, immunotherapy with the combination of these two drugs resulted a better survival than the treatment with sorafenib. And that's the reason it's been considered as a groundbreaking. And I shall not go into the details because this has already been, uh, but uh, summarizing, the overall survival at 12 months is 67.2 as compared to sorafenib, which is 54. And median progression-free survival is 6.8 months as compared to 4.3 months. And what requires to be seen is the side effects and then which we have to remember that the, the hypertension is particularly mentioned as one of the side effects and therefore it, uh, one has to monitor those kind of things. And later, FDA approved the nivolumab plus ipilimumab advanced hepatocellular carcinoma for the previously treated with the sorafenib. And the first arm A has been found to be useful as compared to the arm B and then arm C. As you can see here that uh, I think we should get accustomed to these terms like the better overall response, disease control rate, duration of response, medium ways, progressive disease, stable disease, all in favor of in the form A, in the, in the arm A. And later, the, the, this ongoing one, which is comparing the sorafenib and then lenvatinib and then same combination here. And this is the one with the FDA grants the breakthrough therapy designation to PEM and lenvatinib in advanced cancer in 2019. But in September 2000, it rejects these, the same combination with the first time treatment. And it is issued a complete response letter. And then I would like one of the Sanjay or somebody to explain us what mean, meant by the complete response letter. And this is, of course, the, uh, the they're not recruiting anymore. That 
that is the lenvatinib plus PEM combination, and then in comparison with the lenvatinib or placebo. And these are some of the things which are still uh, ongoing. And the future prospects are the ones within the combination therapy that the evidence of a combination with the local regional therapies is yet to come. As on today, that the local regional therapies and then combination of the, any of the systemic therapies have not been found to be useful. And uh, we will have a more discussion on this particular. And, and uh, therefore, uh, after nearly a decade, five positive phase three trials, the new drugs in the HCC that have been shown to improve the the overall survival time, and then ATI, and then BEVA is the first one, as you can see here, that has been the one which has been found to be uh, superior to sorofenib after nearly 10 years. And for the lenvatinib, as already been told, the first line, for the second line, Regora, Cabo, and then Ramisirumab have been. And uh, therefore, the, 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 the combination therapies which have been alluded to have, uh, I'm sorry for the repetition, uh, but uh, we can have this some amount of a discussion with the local regional therapies and this combination. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao. Again, uh, it was an excellent talk, uh, and especially uh, we're talking about the combination therapies, which is now evolving, and the best combination appears to be the ATI and Vivashilujamab uh, combinations, and I think we'll learn more and more as the trial results are come along. But also we need to understand now the limitations of the current systemic therapy and what are the future perspectives. I would uh, invite uh, uh, Bob, uh, Professor Robert Gis to uh, deliberate on this. Professor Gis. Thank you very much, Sanjaya, and the rest of the speakers for having me here today. I uh, want to wish everybody a good evening. That's morning here in San Diego and looking forward to some uh, beautiful weather and more safety. I'm going to just get my slides set up and one more switch. My slides looking good to everybody? Well, the event so far has been absolutely wonderful. I've learned a lot. Uh, molecular mechanisms, uh, different types of therapy, monotherapy, combination therapy. And I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to set up what are the limitations and what are future issues? I'm gonna call these current and future issues. I work with a number of the different companies in the liver cancer space and my website has a lot of resources for uh, liver cancer as well. Gaps that I won't be covering today are listed on this slide. We obviously are focused mainly on systemic therapy. So I'm gonna talk about what opportunities uh, are in our current environment. Things have been very exciting over the last 30 years in terms of understanding HCC. And most recently, the targeted therapies and systemic therapies have really changed that later stage. And one deficiency that was present five years ago was oncologists really were not involved with liver cancer management, maybe even 10 years ago. This has changed dramatically where just about every oncologist in the world is aware of the systemic therapies and the availability of these compounds. Liver cancer management is still three and four dimensional. These two dimensional tables such as the BCLC uh, management uh, are good, but patients are often moving between these different phases quickly. And most patients are actually getting combination therapy up front, such as a combination of taste and uh, thermal ablation uh, which is standard for all of our patients with relatively small tumors. So one deficiency, one gap is updating this type of diagram to be much more three-dimensional and the dynamics that are taking place with combination therapy. You heard a lot about these therapeutic targets in HCC. Well, I think that pharmaceutical companies were lucky because they came out with what were determined to be multi-kinase inhibitors and also with our checkpoint inhibitors. They really got to liver cancer by accident. So I'm hoping that uh, one of the deficiencies uh, can be corrected in that we are actually designing drugs for liver cancer or we're tar targeting our medications, not at the fact that we have an HCC, but at the tumor specific characteristics. I'm gonna talk quite a bit more about that. Although you had a great introduction from Dr. Aurora. This is a little bit of an older table, but <clears throat> I wanna highlight the median overall survival of these compounds was absolutely I think terrible. 
So a major gap has at least been partially filled because the um, uh, I Am Brave study, for instance, may have a median survival of nearly 30 months and a lot of the other new combination are in the 24 to 28 months. So we're filling that in, but one of the, I think, targets of some of these new therapies is actually to eventually cure HCC. All we're doing with our current systemic therapies is buying time, so to speak. We really need to come out with medications that have a much lower adverse event profile. The dropout rate from serafinib uh, from the Gideon study was very, very high. It was a real world study looking at dose reductions, dose discontinuations due to adverse events. I think this is also gonna be very much the case with all of our current evolving therapies, which have a variety of adverse events. And if you think about our study design for these systemic therapies, they're all in child's uh, A patients, uh, at least up to A6. We have a little bit on B7. We really have almost nothing to offer our patients with B8 and above in that CTP category. Treatment strategies are listed here. I agree with the previous speakers that this is going to be combination therapy with what I call AB therapy first with lenatinib in the COVID times being first line therapy for patients who do not have access to infusion centers and are not able to gain uh, uh, that type of uh, therapy in person, but could be managed potentially by telemedicine. This is the easel guidelines along the left is level of evidence along the bottom is a level of recommendation. I really disagree with one major part of this, which is uh, Y90. I understand that Y90 has issues on limits on availability and cost. And there were the SARA study, there's a Servid study that compared Y90 to serafinib and they called those studies treatment failures. Yet Y90 was non-inferior or equivalent to serafinib in those studies and had a much lower adverse event profile. So I call those studies a treatment success and I would move Y90 to another part of this table. Well, you've heard a lot about uh, combination therapy. I wanna say, yes, we're missing a lot of information, but in the next 12 to 24 months, these combination studies, especially phase three studies are gonna come out. And I think all of our patients will be treated with combination therapy, not just uh, for small tumors such as uh, taste plus mom thermal ablation, but systemic therapies will be almost universally combination therapy. So we need to get this data to our uh, clinic. Along the right side is what we could be doing in terms of public health and primary prevention. We have a number of major gaps there and that's why so many patients present with late stage disease. But the deficiency we have, deficiencies we have right now is not, uh, we are not able to profile our HCC patients, because we no longer biopsy patients. LIRADS was a fantastic advance in terms of making a diagnosis without tissue, but we really need to be going back, I believe, to getting tissue biopsies for targeted and non-targeted therapies. And I'll be talking about some of those mutational signatures and cancer drivers shortly. Liquid biopsy, I think, would be quite useful, but we need to be able to determine PDL1 and PD1 status through uh, blood tests. And I think that may be improved with uh, a special technology called a Velcro technology that we could talk about during the uh, discussion. Well, these genetic mutations that you heard about from Anil during his presentations evolve over time. And I'm gonna talk about another major issue in a moment, but these major mutations, which there's 40 to 60s in the HCC show that this tumor has extreme heterogeneity. And that may be one of the reasons why we have uh, probably three to four billion dollars US that uh, have invested in targeted therapy or systemic therapies, and yet many of these have failed, such as the, the Brivin um, uh, compounds. Another area I'd like to highlight is this extreme intratumoral heterogeneity that is present. It's a clonal issue or a multi-clonal issue. Each clone has its own characteristic. So will biopsy of the direct tissue be sufficient? Probably not. We may be doing multi-sampling, maybe doing FNA, or may come back down to uh, circulating <coughs> tumor cells, circulating tumor DNA, um, microRNA uh, uh, vesicles to determine what's happening in the liver. And of course, it's not just these clonal expansions that are taking place, but there's interactions with extracellular matrix. You've already heard a lot about the immune system and I'll be uh, developing a little bit more on that shortly. This is a little bit more on genetic heterogeneity. The upper left graph highlights these uh, mutational signatures with uh, p-values. 
On the right side, I'd like to highlight that not only are we having mutational uh, changes that result in deletions, but also in gains. Those gains uh, potentially could be targetable, but we're going to talk about that in just a moment. So these most common, such as TERT, the CTNN, um, ARID, uh, Axon, are considered unactionable now, that we don't have agents. And there's a perception within pharma that these can't be directly uh, targeted with uh, new therapies. I believe this will change, um, but if you look at the right graph, we have a major problem because only 20% of patients or 25% of patients have actionable uh, targets. The HCC microenvironment is very, very heterogeneous. We talked about stroma, interaction with fibrous tissue. You can, by looking at pathology, have a somewhat on a, a subjective level uh, prognostic changes, um, and this eventually may become useful in terms of determining what uh, therapies um, to apply. This microenvironment is very, very important, but here it is very, uh, very important research, not only came out from Yovet, from uh, the New York uh, Spain collaboration, but also in this article in Gastro, that it's the surrounding tissue that's very important. And I'd like you to look at the second line down in that surrounding issues, which is these CD8 T cells. It's like CD8 and CD3 may actually help us determine the immune environment and may actually eventually allow us to choose what type of immune therapy to provide. This new integrated classification looks at a little bit more simplistic model of proliferation class on the left and non-proliferation on the right with some very specific molecular structures uh, and clusters that are present. We have differences in chromosomal instability and this heterogeneity, I think, will need to be further defined in terms of uh, uh, prognosis for the patient and what agents that we're going to be using. We're very much hoping that um, this liquid biopsies will allow us to sample what's happening in the body and in the tumor without doing repeat biopsies on our patients. Extracellular vesicles are also markers of liver pathology. I think these will mature uh, in the next few years as another part of the liquid biopsy system here you can see a number of microRNAs that are um, at least sampleable by getting serum or plasma on patients. And their profiles of these are present for healthy controls as well as in patients with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. This may eventually guide therapy as well. So look in the lower right-hand corner of this graph and you're looking at drug and biomarker pairs. So this is a little bit of some projection but by sampling our tumors, especially looking at mutations and uh, amplifications in FGF19, looking at TP53 mutations that are there, MET amplifications, we may, be allow, may allow us to design studies and look at combination studies as well. As you know, there's a there was a drug called Tavantinib that was being developed for CMET high tumors. Uh, the study was well designed, but that was a failure. So even a targeted therapy at a specific, specific change in HCC did not result in success. And we do not uh, fully understand why. So systemic therapies available in our patients. I wanna highlight the discussion you had about ramucirumab. We do have one biomarker and that's alpha feeder protein. And AFP is not just a side effect of the cellular uh, uh, replication. AFP actually manipulates the own microenvironment around the HCC, including influencing the immune system and influencing things such as neovascularization. So ramucirumab, who went through the REACH study, REACH2 specifically, was found to be beneficial in high AFP patients, although the change in survival was uh, modest. What about candidate tumor genomic biomarker signals? Well, we talked about MET before. This is unfortunately only amplified in two to 6% of HCC patients. But if you add up a number of these, including FGF19, another five to 10% of patients, what's called TSC loss, and another 10%, you're starting to see some specific uh, tumor profiles that may provide characteristics in up to a third of our patients. A little bit more on these genomic biomarkers, talking about uh, FGF19, look in the lower right corner, this visogatinib uh, was uh, it's targeted for patients that are FGF9 overexpressed. And you can see on the right side in this waterfall plot that there's substantial uh, tumor response in a subset of patients. Immune signatures we talked about earlier. This gives a little bit more detail. 
on the CD8 T cells and a variety of other uh, uh, inflammatory and immune uh, signatures that take place. In the lower section, you can see we can stain for PD-1 and PDL one although in current clinical trials, this is not shown to be useful. But you have to realize in many of the clinical trials, we have very little tissue sampling. And also our stains and our ways to measure PD-1 and PDL one are very immature. And clearly we need to be having uh, more advanced uh, bulk tissue analyses and what's uh, circulating in the serum and plasma. This TKIs with checkpoint inhibitor has a huge amount of science behind it. I'm very excited about uh, these next uh, set of studies that will be out looking at multi-kinase inhibitors uh, in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, but we're still missing on which is the best patient for this combination. Again, there's a major gap because the uh, research studies are undersampling patients in terms of tissue and undersampling patients in terms of serum uh, banks or plasma banks for uh, helping to look uh, retrospectively at tumor response as new assays become available. Going back just a little bit more general issues, you heard uh, in Dr. Aurora's discussion, he had a point about aflatoxins. Can we actually measure those in our patients in the tissue and circulating and would that uh, change with that signature 24 in terms of what therapies are applied? We have mismatch repair defects. Is that going to change the therapies? Uh, if we have HPV and what's called insertional mutagenesis, will that end up changing what therapies we apply? Obviously, if you treat hepatitis B early from two papers that were published at AASLD uh, just a week ago, you decrease that insertional mutagenesis process using our current oral nucleotide analogs such as TDF. Alcohol-related, uh, NASH-related disease, are these not just changing how uh, HCC develops, but eventually will they change what uh, systemic therapies that we apply? I agree very much with the statement about multidisciplinary team management. I feel like this is also a major gap. I work in California and Nevada and a number of communities, and they're just starting to bring in hepatology into these tumor boards. They're typically run by oncologists, and we need to be able to reach these tumor boards to talk about under, treating the underlying liver disease in our HCC patients. This is a major gap. We have our international guidelines committees that say don't treat hepatitis C until you have the liver cancer under control or ablated. I think this is completely wrong. If you have hepatitis C patient and liver cancer, you need to treat the hepatitis C to a cure immediately. I think the data is false that by treating hepatitis C, HCC becomes more aggressive, more pathogenic, um, more dedifferentiated. Um, treating underlying hepatitis B is important as well to improve uh, liver function. There's a really nice uh, abstract and paper that was presented at ASLD on treating NASH patients with decompensated liver disease with an SGLT2 and improving liver function and decreasing uh, the severity of portal hypertension. So I think it's important to be treating NASH aggressively when you have a patient with HCC. I think this is a major gap and a place that we can move uh, things forward. Multidisciplinary teams improve HCC outcomes. This has been shown over and over again in a number of different research studies. Let's move this to the standard of care globally through programs such as ECHO or telemedicine, telehealth. Uh, we can get multi multidisciplinary care to almost all parts of the world. I wanna thank the Delhi Liver Foundation, uh, my co-speakers, uh, Sanjaya for helping to chair this with the rest of your uh, speakers. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Again, well, that we have yeah. well, well, uh, 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 this is the next is uh, Sanjay, the open house, if there is any questions, otherwise we will conclude and summarize the whole discussion. Uh, please ask if there are any questions, that's what according to the program, um, because uh, there is an open house discussion after that. Right. Uh, uh, is there any chat box, any questions? I don't uh, see any questions on the chat box. So maybe we can um, jive in and have some questions to the each, each of the speaker. Oh, can I summarize that before that, or before you bring in uh, yes. some questions? Uh, am I permitted to summarize the whole thing? Yes, yes sir. Yes. 
well uh, this has been very interesting discussion with our friends and uh, we have all the four speakers uh, providing us new information to start the ball rolling and uh, professor uh, dr anil lorora actually gave us uh, a very interesting uh, direction to the molecular drivers of liver cancer he showed the synergism between the primary liver injury predominantly because virus alcohol or fatty liver disease causing cell damage matrix remodulation dna damage and genetic changes which is getting perpetuated by leaky gut which he told the pam which induces pro inflammatory cytokines which itself per se have further change the micro environment of the tissues inside the liver we just trying to regenerate and third very interesting thing he added that the change from m1 to m2 which is normally physiologically meant for repair is used for tumor carcinogenesis because m2 causes angiogenesis limitless replication of the cell for tissue repairs as well as prevent right half migrations of the cells and which helps in prevention of apoptosis which is the basic mechanism of any cancer that is formation of stem cells limitless replications angiogenesis prevention of apoptosis and migration of the cell essential part of the liver cancer he also uh, provided the various molecular drivers and possible intervention particularly in these various areas where he pointed out intervention against molecular drivers particularly tyrosine kinase inhibitors which are receptor for cell proliferation he also uh, provided us how the liver cancer evade the immune system by pd1 ligands or uh, uh, pd1 ligands binding with co stimulatory molecule hans nullify right uh, or uh, um, helping the mechanism of right uh, uh, opposite i told how the p uh, cell uh, regulatory cell increasing ctl of 4 ctl a 4 is helping to evade immune system so he brought in the genetic problems the injury the inflammation and immune escape mechanism working together in uh, 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 causing liver cancer and a propagation of liver cancer and uh, dr asuni singhal brilliantly pointed out out that with the advent of this knowledge now the number of drugs which are available to treat advanced liver cancer has increased and he divided this drug into three lines the first line drug he clearly mentioned there are three drugs that are available the old experience use of sorafenib then the non infinity triad of lenvatinib and the recent one combination of etigelimumab which is a pd1 ligand blocker with the anti angiogenic drug that is bevacizumab showing uh, 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 probably comparative or little better response than the sorafenib hence has been included in the first line of the drug <laughs> and dr singhal also pointed out the lenvatinib had advantage over sorafenib particularly in objective response rate in progression free survival time to progression and there is a subgroup i think ashwini missed it those patient with alpha beta-protein more than 200 uh, has a better overall survival with lenvatinib in comparison to sorafenib which in uh, masatosikudos trial published in lancet on collapse now the second line drug he pointed out are uh, regorafenib particularly in those patient who are with sorafenib there is progression further progression where the regorafenib has been added and as shown to improve overall survival as well as progression of the tumor prevent progression of the tumor 
He also pointed out those patients who do not tolerate sorafenib and there is a progression, carbogenative is a good drug, which is a second line drug, which is used in those where sorafenib intolerance is there. Further, two drugs, barring lenvatinib, ramishirmuva has been found to be useful in subgroup of patients who have high alpha veto producing tumor. That's what the Asuni told us. He also pointed out that the third line agents, which are particularly immunotherapy, that is the immune checkpoint inhibitor, except against PD-1 and against CTLF-4, particularly pembrolizumab, nivolumab, and now lipilimumab are promising but we need more objective data. And he also pointed out the, uh, when you are treating this uh, 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 drugs with various uh, 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 immunotherapy or uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, you have to take care of the viruses and uh, you have to also treat the other associated uh, problems causing liver failure. Now, Dr. P. N. Rao actually uh, provided a lot of uh, uh, further information on this combination, but overall he told the idea was whether you can combine this drug with curative treatment and prevent recurrence, that was the subject, particularly post-transplant adjuvant therapy with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are already established, post-ablation, with adjuvant therapy and post trans arterial chemoembolization or tear or SBRT with the drug, whether they are helpful. Unfortunately, the evidence is poor because most of the trial has taken the endpoint as progression and not overall survival. A recent study with Hamasato Sikudo has suggested that if you don't take the endpoint as progression and take the endpoint as overall survival and continue to treat with your transarterial chemoembolization and add on this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, he has shown a median survival reaching in the BCLCC up to 36 months. This study has been published and that is an important study where the endpoint should not be taken as progression of the tumor, but an overall survival. Now, uh, mostly Dr. Gis pointed out the gross, uh, despite advantage, we are limitations. First thing he point out the tolerance and discontinuation of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And the real life scenario that many patients do not tolerate because of diarrhea, hand food syndrome, hypertension, and problems with platelet. And also he pointed out that even though in oncological term, the overall survival has increased, the amount of increase in survival is probably not substantial to indeed in the large area of resource constant country where access to this therapy is out of pocket 80% and is an expensive therapy providing a small survival which will be probably not very cost effective in general. That's what he's trying to say. He also pointed out that if all the registration trial has been done in child say patients and ECO one or two patients, your majority of patients are not child say or ECO one or two. They are probably much more patient, but Anil, I, and many of us in India, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Far East, in Africa, where 80% of liver cancer occurs, they don't see this group of patients are small. I will see, I remember my data from All India Institute, it is less than 15% of the total liver cancer. It increased to 25% we started screening of high risk patients. That's one of the major things. He also pointed out that Dr. Gis pointed out, when you treat this patient, you treat the liver disease as well. Particularly if you have advanced viruses, you may bleed and die. 
Now, third thing, and another important thing he pointed out, molecular driver in liver cancer is not one. It is multiple. And for each tumor, the molecular driver may be varied. And the immune, system, immune behavior also may be varied. And it is not practical to take biopsy from each focus to have a personalized medicine. Therefore, he emphasized on liquid biopsies, particularly to understand on immunotherapy. This genetic heterogeneity needs further evaluation, further classification, despite the molecular pathogenetic classification of liver cancer has been available, its practical use is grossly limited, particularly for clinicians, unless it's much more simplified and practical, right? Technologies, making it simple is available to provide the benefit to people in general. He also pointed out the tumor is not only having a loan, it is not only TUT, it is not mTOR, it is not P53, it is also microenvironment, right? The microenvironment also modulate liver cancer, and he pointed out the degree of fibrosis, the degree of inflammation, and microRNAs. Now, many studies has shown the tumor aggressiveness or tumor suppressions or microRNAs. And he thinks, right, this tumorogenic biomarkers further an analysis of tumorogenic biomarkers, along with liquid biopsy, may make life much more simple in this complex disease where we need a multidisciplinary approach, rightly pointed out. I thought that's what I learned from all of you, essentially, and uh, any other further inputs or comment, you are welcome. Uh, Dr. Rath. Uh, I, I thought that you know, my impression was that you know, adding local regional therapies with the sorafenib, there have been empty number of trials and then local and there are many and meta analysis and I found that and it's generally it's not recommended. And the latest drugs, so the PD1 and then CTL4 are still in the progress. Uh, to my best of my knowledge, I don't think anything has come out, any solid information has come out combining and then recommendations. Um, I mean I can I agree with Dr. You, Dr. Rao, but what I'm trying to say, I've studied all these study, all these trials, and if you see the endpoint is progression. Right. Whereas they are child A patients, but the endpoint is progression. So therefore, you are actually taking a end accordingly that you will get the result. And the meta-analysis will so see the same thing. The endpoint, whereas contradictory, the end point is overall survival in such patients. It is not only progression. You are trying them in a good patients with good liver function, and you are not giving them adjuvant therapy. In fact, that's what Japanese do. Actually, I learned from Japanese that don't stop the treatment despite progression. Add on the treatment, and you may stop the progression. That's the message. So let us not, and that's also the data from my own experience, which should be published, which you have done at All India Institute. I don't stop at two tasks continue up to six or seven when they tolerate add on serapinate and our people have survived more than five years, six years, they will be there. So that is the point what Kuda published. I think I can send you that publications and there's a large data. There's a Japanese data I'll wait, uh, don't deny. You need to replicate the data, but there are now indications. So the end point is very important when you see the registration trial. That's my personal comment. I don't contest the meta-analysis. I don't contest all these trials. I don't contest the guideline based on these studies. Yes, the guidelines, as Dr. Gis pointed out, the guidelines, the adjuvant therapy has no role, ESL recommendations, because there are based evidence-based guidelines. But these are the questions, these are discussion which I'm opening up based on all these information. You know, one of the problem actually, you know, here, uh, when you combine haze or tear along with a combination of systemic therapy, uh, there is hesitations because of the potential side effects. So usually they do sequential rather than as a combination. So you're starting one therapy and see how the patient is tolerating. And then you can add, uh, of course, this has also not been studied well as of now. But if we are looking forward to a combination, I think a sequential therapy, uh, knowing the patient, how they're going to tolerate, whether they're going to decompensate after a taste, 
and then adding the a second combination systemic therapy probably is a better way to do this. Uh, I agree with Sanjay. There will be various opinion. There are various type of combination, sequential <laughs> combination therapy. But question is, it's still now the jury is open. Uh, the debate will continue because we know very little. And uh, we have now uh, ammunition in our hand, which excites clinicians to try various methods. And uh, Professor Gies rightly pointed out that uh, this is a disease uh, which is a very heterogeneous disease of various bad drivers, of various components. And you need to uh, probably uh, have a simultaneous uh, check on all the components, depending upon the understanding. You probably need a lot of more inputs on this disease to develop various interventions, keeping that this happens in serotics, where the vi virus is killed, the virus is killed, the liver failure, dysfunction kills, the complications further, infection kills, the systemic hemodynamic kills over which the tumor occurs. So there are a lot of other inputs that obviously is very clear, but certain points has emerged Newer drugs has emerged, and therefore it is exciting time. Therefore, this discussion and these are opinions. I have a question to Dr. Dr. Gis. Actually, I think he pointed out one of the very important finding uh, or was suggested that you know her patients with hepatitis C with HCC, uh, you shouldn't hold the treatment for uh, with the DAA. My question to you, Bob, is you know there has been this agitation come from some studies where they're saying they're just sanctuary the tumor harbors the hepatitis C and then doesn't allow the penetration of the drug as well. Uh, and so there's a, there is a high risk of relapse. Uh, if the response, well, it's great, but the chances of relapse is higher. And that's setting the hesitation not to combine DA uh, and um, uh, you know, patients with HCC uh, to treat those patients. Tell me, what do you think about that? And I'll ask a second question as a follow-up after that. Great question, Sanjaya. The major point here is, is that the cure rate with DAAs and liver cancer is in the 70 to 80 percent range. So you're going to help 70 to 80 percent of patients by improving liver function, decreasing enzymes, improving renal function, improving quality of life, and it decreases the confusion that you may have with elevated liver tests during therapy if you can remove the hepatitis C from the environment. So you're going to help 70 to 80% of patient management. If the patient relapses, they don't always relapse with resistance. So you could potentially treat them again as you're treating that liver cancer. And maybe by that time, you've ablated the tumor. And if they do develop resistance, we have second and even third line therapies. So I think we can eventually cure all these people, most with first uh, treatment, but with second or third courses and other people. Meanwhile, you're benefiting the patient. Um, remember these people are infectious. There's also a stigma associated with hepatitis C. So treating hepatitis C can help the patients, I think from seven different perspectives. What are your thoughts? Well, I think in, this is in contrast to hepatitis C, where there is a debate and Dr. I agree with Dr. Gis. In hepatitis B, Unless you treat with the antiviral, there is a higher recurrence rate of liver cancer. So the virus, if they're caused, I think you should treat it. And the previous uh, uh, thinking that there is an increased incidence of liver cancers in those patients treated with DA, probably untrue because they are all cirrhotic. You, you used to never treat them earlier because with interferon and rivaverine because they have advanced fibrosis. So. Uh, Dr. Gis is absolutely right, right? Because there is a large component of uh, liver disease, um, uh, which is very important. Yeah, so the question actually comes here uh, again to maybe anybody else also can talk about it. Like if a patient of advanced HCC you have and who is not eligible for transplant um, or any kind of surgical resection, now you're talking about systemic therapies in advanced HCC, hepatitis C, now, you're going to treat the tumor first, or you treat the tumor and the DA in combination, or you wait for the tumor objective response, then you treat this patient with the DA. That would be an important question to answer. I don't think it's been studied well, but still, I think we'd like to understand that. Uh, uh, what I will do, I will downstage the tumor. Downstaging tumor is a big concept today. 
So downstaging tumor improves, gives you time. And with downstaging tumor, I will treat the virus as well. Because that's a very important component. 30 to 40% of tumor, which is not resectable, which is not transplantable, today is transplantable and resectable if you downstage it. And therefore, since downstaging is possible with the available therapy, I personally do that. Right, I combine that with antiviral therapy along with the downstaging of the tumor. That's not my personal opinion because the data is not there. You need firm data on this. I don't know what Dr. Giss does or Dr. Anil does or what you do or Dr. Rao does. Uh, I think there is, there is a little difference, I think, because of the way we approach the transplant in, in the in the US and India, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. because well, the living donor is a primary, um, you know, uh, That's way right. of, of, you know, tra transplanting them. Here, and I, now the door is open for hepatitis C, um, uh, positive donors. And so treating them before, if they're transplant candidate, you're downstaging them and transplant candidate, probably treating is, treatment is not necessary, but uh, because you can treat them and get the hepatitis C organs uh, and, and get these patients for the transplant. Uh, but if it's not a candidate, it's an advanced HCC, not a candidate, and you can downstage, but I don't know whether you can objectively downstairs enough to get the patients transplanted. So the question at this time arises, so we treat them uh, so that we can improve their overall synthetic function to allow them to get a treatment for, uh, for the HCC with the systemic therapy. Okay, that's what, that, that's, that essentially is the same thing. Uh, can I ask a question, Dr. Ashwini Singhal, uh, if uh, moderators permit me? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, as Dr. Acharya very rightly said, in Indian scenario, very few people come with early HCCs. So most of the patients who come to us, they are in the child, uh, BCLC, C, D, and ECOG, hardly ever better than two or three. And the major component of their problem, as Dr. Acharya rightly mentioned, is liver disease. And that is how they come to you, be it with the cystis, anorexia, weight loss, large lump anorexia. So where is the role of oncology here? As you have been repeatedly stressing that you would have a multidisciplinary team. So we hardly have any role for oncology or maybe we are missing it. So I think uh, that's an important point. And uh, uh, my take on that is that, um, I think you raised two or three important points. The first point is what to do with patients who are child B or child C, as most of the trials, uh, as uh, uh, Bob and I showed, that are enrolled mainly from uh, CTPA class in most of the trials. So um, B8 or beyond has not been studied. Uh, but if you go back into the literature, um, sorafenib and some of the other uh, drugs have been retrospectively studied in this population. So my take is if you encounter a patient with, um, say for example, child B, uh, nine or 10, maybe sorafenib may be a better option as a frontline therapy and not use uh, Eto and Bevo combination. Um, uh, so that may be uh, something to consider. The second point you raise about uh, patients who have decompensated disease and have complications like ascites and other issues which can kill the patient and very important point. And I want to uh, congratulate and thank uh, Dr. Acharya for summarizing the talks so well, so well. I've never heard uh, such a nice summary from a chairperson and a moderator as Dr. Acharya did. Very nice job done. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. So uh, the, the point of uh, having complications from cirrhosis and liver disease, I think is very relevant because uh, when we talk about overall survival as a primary endpoint in a clinical trial, we're missing that part because patients could die, not from cancer, but from complications of cirrhosis. And that is why I think FDA and other investigators brought objective response and progression-free survival as important endpoints, not only for analysis of the study, but also as basis for FDA approval. As you saw, some of the drugs were approved. Even the overall survival was not different, but objective response rate 
uh, was different, for example, Lenvetinib and Nivolumab. And lastly, about the multidisciplinary approach, uh, especially re related to oncology. And I agree, if you're using sorafenib alone, I think we hepatologists are good enough in managing patients on sorafenib. But I think uh, more and more when you use these uh, uh, oncoming drugs and combination therapies, maybe oncology would become part of the, uh, uh, part of the team, uh, apart from radiologists and pathologists and uh, pathologist and uh, uh, other other members of the team. Uh, as G uh, Bob Gish pointed out very clearly that tumor genetics is going to become uh, more and more uh, into uh, playing a role in uh, selecting the drugs for right kind of patients uh, to improve their response rates. So, but uh, your point is well taken, Anil, that if you're using sorafenib alone, maybe you don't need to involve oncology. Uh, you can manage the patient's liver disease, tumor, get radiologists uh, into the team for uh, interpreting. Uh, I don't know what Bob and other think. Well, um, actually, Anil, there is a real life uh, study called Gideon study, published in Liver International long back, if you remember that. And the Gideon study says, uh, in fact, uh, sorafenib has a marginal benefit even with uh, BCL, CB and C patients. And that's a real life scenario of multicentric study. And, um, but the tolerance, as Dr. Gis pointed out, the cost, right, and discontinuation of the drug is a big, big problem, right? In this uh, patients who are invariably go more than epoch two, right? Then the sarcopenia is a problem. The recitis is a problem. The infection rate is a problem. Their varices are the problem. They have multiple problems. And that's why Anil is pointing this out to us. You have seen these patients yourself. Sanjay, you have seen this patient yourself during your training period, right? They are absolutely a different ball game altogether. And that's why he points out how does oncologist helps. And remember, our oncologists are general oncologist. You need hepatic oncologist. Specific, there is a branch which should evolve what I call as a hepatic oncologist, understanding about the liver disease as a whole. You are all hepatologists and you understand how complex liver disease is. And that's why Anil is raising this question. Well, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's an important point, uh, which uh, Subroto, you're raising, um, that uh, involving an oncologist which is interested in uh, liver disease is relevant. And we, at our place, and I think Bob's place also, uh, tumor boards in hepatology usually have an oncologist sitting. That's very important. Uh, and, and in a group of 12 or 13 oncologists, we always see one or two oncologists coming repeatedly to these tumor boards because the rest 10 may not have interest in liver disease and those two may be more interested in liver disease. And now, as Bob pointed out, uh, HCC is being represented even in oncology tumor boards uh, because uh, these specific drugs and more special drugs are coming. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that is true, actually. And here as well in Northwell, you know, we have a specific hepatic oncologist, as you said. You know, there's a tumor board uh, that we have every week. and. Uh, Specific hepatic oncologist who has only interest in HCC, nothing else. That's, right. Right. So, right. that's, that's what, what we need actually in India. Yes, I think that needs to be developed uh, as, as now that so many drugs are available, so more complexity in terms of choosing what drug and are not. So, Anil, you have your answer. You are the chairman of the uh, hospital. Now, have the tumor board with hepatic oncologists. So, show the country the new directions. Yes. So, one last question from Dr. Ashuni. Two yeah. issues. One is most of the published data in HCC is on child A or up to B, up to seven. But most of us see patient beyond it. Is it legally, is it safe to legally give them this, number one? Number two, the type of dose which we give, because the established dose is say 800 milligram in the lowest paper. But the type of dose which we give, say 200 to 400, which most of the patient do not tolerate, is that efficacious at all? And then we'll wind up. Yes. No, I think uh, we have tried uh, in patients who are intolerant to serafinib, and this is my personal opinion, uh, in, in a post-transplant setting and even in a pre-transplant setting, um, uh, in a post-transplant setting because they are on immunosuppression and other medications, in a pre-transplant se setting because their liver function, uh, we typically start at a lower dose, maybe 200 BID, 
Uh, and, and we have seen people that even responding, I remember uh, anecdotal examples, the tumors have disappeared on Serafin. And you may have seen all of you. Uh, yes. So I think this is a fancy environment, micro environment of the tumor, where response is so unpredictable from patient to patient uh, because of, uh, you, because we're not checking how their, uh, you know, responsive genes are in that particular patient. And patients who are not responding, whether the genes are mutated or not. So there are a lot of things which go into the response rate. But if you encounter, or if I encounter a patient who is child B or C, say, for example, CTB9 or 10, and has a tumor and has an advanced disease, and I cannot use the other drugs, I would, I would give a chance to the patient to give serafinib after discussing and explaining um, that, the, that these are the possible side effects. And if the patient is willing to undertake that treatment, uh, knowing that uh, the performance status and other criteria are met in terms of a bilirubin um, meets with, you know, going ahead with uh, giving a patient the therapy, I will go ahead and give the patient the therapy. You know, we all uh, been talking about the object, uh, object uh, overall response rate so often. I think I should define that this is actually important that the overall response rate is the proportion of patients in a trial whose tumor is destroyed or significantly reduced by the drug. And the, that includes the partial response, partial responders, as well as the complete responders. I think that's important for our listeners to understand that partial responder is at least 30% response. That's right. Actually, M resist criteria should be also discussed. Actually, complete response, partial response, stable disease, progressive disease, as well as overall clinical benefit, and from which you decide the URR. Yes. I think if there is no more questions, yeah. can you wind up? Yeah, I think uh, it is time for me to say goodbye to all. But before saying goodbye, let me point out to Dr. Ashwini Singhal that you should not be surprised that you had such a good summary. You would compliment me for choosing a very good moderator. Right. He's not only the doyen of hepatocellular carcinoma in India, but whole of Asia. He has a first-hand experience of handling the patient in all in Institute of Medical Sciences single-handedly in handwritten notes as my teacher for the last 30 years. So whatever he speaks, it is not a contemporary rhetoric. It is, in fact, coming from his heart. So you would compliment him that you had a good summary. But I will fully agree with you. That if, even if somebody has missed the whole lecture, if he would have listened to 10 minutes talk of Dr. Acharya, would still be benefited. Well, thank I you. Agree. I agree. I agree. Time for with that, I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Acharya, as uh, uh, always, and Dr. Uh, Sat Sanjay, Dr. Rao, Dr. Ashwini, and Dr. Robert Gish for giving us this opportunity of discussing with you the nuances of hepatocellular carcinoma and the limitation we have in the current therapy. I'm also thankful to our scientific partner, ICI, for having given us this platform. I look forward to see you again soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, friends. See you Bye -bye. again and enjoy. Bye-bye.